next we will have uh, uh, so the next talk will be given by uh, Chen. Uh, he's a professor in our department, and he received his PhD uh, from Stanford in 2001. His research interests are in the fields of data management and information search, including the tax search, tax search, data clustering, data integration, and data intensive computing. Uh, Chen received an NSF Korea Award in 2003 and many other NSF grants and industrial gifts. Um, he has also recently uh, funded a company to commercialize his research. So, let's welcome Chen. Listening to your talk, I was thinking, you know, in many movies, uh, they tend to have a computer geek. You think about the Mission Impossible movies, the yes. Jurassic Park movies, and the other one. Um, War Games? Yeah, there's one more, uh, uh, 007, James Bond. And I wonder if you run your algorithm on the voice or the typing uh, sound of those movies, what would you get? Is there something? Um, I'm very eager to know. Well, AI algorithm really works. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. When you don't have any training instances for, for those. Uh, those uh, no, that's the problem. I mean, so we have to learn uh, only based on frequency analysis. Yeah. Sound frequency, which is right. So then the, the most uh, frequent uh, sound would probably correspond to the most frequently occurring letter, right? And, mm. and but I, I, it'd be interesting to know what the, those people really type. Right. So I know just, they're just making some noise to just pretend they're very, very computer geeky there. So, so, so uh, my, my talk is about uh, uh, big uh, social media data analysis. Uh, Gene put me to the, the category of uh, big data uh, research. Um, and I'm going to use uh, one particular domain called big, uh, social media to, sh to illustrate some of the work uh, we have been doing in this space of uh, big data management. Um, so the motivation is very simple, uh, social media. Uh, especially because of these kind of devices, uh, human beings are becoming more like sensors. We are generating a lot of data uh, every hour, every, every minute, every second. Even look at people in this room, at this moment, how many people are holding some devices in your hand, right? Either, either the Jane is a good example, he's now he's going back to his email, <laughs> or some cell phone you're using, and what's the last time you, you're using your cell phone to, to, to reply email or uh, check some, uh, or reply, uh, do some tweets. Um, the big picture here is, uh, as internet getting everywhere, uh, mobile devices are getting uh, more commonly used. We're generating lots of data, and especially in the social media space, like uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google Hangouts, uh, or in China, like Weibo or Weixin. And the uh, main question is how we can manage and analyze this kind of huge amount of uh, social media data. So this is uh, the motivation of our work. So the value of the data is tremendous. Um, first, the data is huge. Uh, we all see some numbers about, say, uh, how many tweets are generated per second. And this number could be even bigger in other countries like China where uh, they have a larger population. So once the data is large, clearly the more asset you can gain from the, from the data. The second big advantage is real time because the data is happening, uh, it's generated as things are happening. If, uh, if you can use some of the APIs to get the latest data, you can uh, see what's going on right now, and you can make some uh, time-critical decisions. Okay. And the other one is, compared to many other traditional methods to get data, uh, social media data is relatively easier to get, especially for services such as Twitter. Uh, if you look at a public health domain, people have to spend a tremendous amount of uh, time and effort to do interviews, to do face-to-face uh, -face interviews, or to phone interviews in order to collect data. But now, if you can just use, say, the Twitter API, you can get lots of data as they are happening. And then the cost of getting the data and then gain the insight is much, much lower. 
compared to many traditional methods. And the other thing about the data is, surprisingly, uh, you'll be amazed by about how much information this, this kind of social media can reveal, or to some degree, how much privacy people are willing to share on, the, on social media. In this case, I'm going to give you one example of a tweet where this person said, sometimes I'm doing random things, I just really randomly hate the fact that I have diabetes. Okay, and then if you can treat this, if you rely on, you can trust this tweet, now you can pretty much know that this person has diabetes. I'm using diabetes as just one example. Uh, in some other uh, ongoing collaboration we have with some other uh, researchers, uh, they're doing research about HIV or even sex-related behaviors. And you'll be amazed about how much people are willing to share on social media about all these kind of activities. At the same time, in order to deal with this kind of data, we also need to face a lot of challenges. Uh, the first challenge, again, is about the volume. Since the data is so large, um, storing, uh, uh, indexing, and analyzing the kind of data becomes a big issue. Clearly, due to a high rate and large volume, a single machine cannot handle these kind of uh, tasks. Uh, clearly, we need some parallel infrastructure to achieve the goal. Uh, the other one is, since uh, this kind of data is tend to be real time, the solution we're developing has to be able to take ingestion data very efficiently as they come into the system uh, with a very high, with a high uh, rate. For example, if you look at the, the Twitter uh, example, uh, very often they tend to send a, set a new record if there's some historical event either like a soccer game or some, some uh, attack, then the huge number of tweets can be generated per second. How can you develop such a system that can take care of this kind of a very bursty uh, ingestion rate into a system? That's one of the challenges. In addition, uh, I'm using Twitter as an example, even though the discussion is also general to many other cases. Uh, this kind of data, they tend to have many, many different attributes. Uh, they tend to have a time attribute, to record where the thing happened, and they also have a kind of a location to, sh to record when that tweet was was uh, was generated, and also maybe some some keywords to describe the content. Not to mention a few other attributes like uh, the username and the number of followers, number of tweets. So the data is very rich in terms of uh, the, the the kinds of information they have. And another thing we are facing is uh, I have uh, quite a few conversations with people from other disciplines, especially in public health. And there's one group of people who are trying to use social media to analyze uh, information about the diabetes. Uh, another group is doing something about uh, sleep disorder. There's one more group uh, with the UCLA uh, colleagues doing research about HIV and uh, drug-related behaviors. And in many of these conversations, we notice that the people who want to do this kind of analysis, they're not uh, computer geeks who can type in very fast. And they tend to have uh, their domain uh, expertise in epidemiology uh, or, or public health or climate change, but they know little about computer science. This is one issue. Second issue, even for us, for our faculty, for, for PhD students, uh, for even some software engineers, when you do this kind of analysis, you still don't want to write code. It's not about your skills. It's really about, more about efficiency. If I can do one thing within one hour, I do not want to do the same thing within one day. So how can we reduce the, 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 the time and effort needed to do this kind of analysis? And even for uh, non-IT people, this is the, one of the challenges we had to face. So um, one more thing is, uh, this kind of data, uh, the analysis is, interest, is related to many different uh, CS domains. A, a good example is the pre previous case I said, that tweet said, I have diabetes. Suppose my task is I want to identify all the public available tweets, those users who have potentially have uh, diabetes. Okay, this is my task. I want to identify users who have a diabetes. Of course, I've used diabetes as an example. We can also use like uh, sleep disorder, depression, and other, other subjects uh, as you wish. The question is how can we analyze this kind of data to identify those suspects? But what we can do it is, I use a keyword search, I have diabetes. But this is very strong, because many, very often, people may say, I, I'm, I'm, I eat too much sugar, I eat too much food, maybe I should be more careful. 
this kind of sentences can also be treated as indicator that this person might have diabetes, or the person may say, I don't think I have diabetes. How do you treat these kind of tweets? This is the opposite. And to, to understand this kind of uh, insights of your, your data, you need information, and you need to know techniques uh, in a domain like uh, machine learning and NLP, so it across the different uh, disciplines. Clearly, to, to do this kind of support, we had to do collaborations with other areas, not just data, data management. So uh, I gave enough in motivation. So next, I'm going to show you a few systems we have been developing developing in our group. Uh, they, they tackle different aspects of, of the problem uh, with the main theme of how to make uh, social media data analysis easier and more efficient. And also, I want to mention that even though we use social media as one very uh, strong motivation, uh, the general solution we're developing is, is general purpose. It can be used for other domains, such as uh, IoT applications or log analysis. But we focused on social media because because of the importance. So next, I'm going to show a few systems, mainly uh, for, for demonstration purposes. So the first system we have, we have been building for the last uh, uh, one and a half years is called uh, Cloudberry uh, plus Asterisk DB. Uh, before I show you what what's, what's uh, happening behind the scene, so let me just uh, switch to a, a browser and show you a live demo. And everything I'm showing here is live. And so if, if uh, uh, you're interested, you, you're welcome to to try them uh, by all. So the the first system we are building, uh, the prototype is called the Twitter map. So from name you can tell, this system is uh, doing kind of a map analysis of tweets. Um, the back end of this system has uh, currently has about the two, the eight to 28 million tweets. Uh, it is about 1% uh, of all the US tweets. Uh, so Twitter provides an API using which you can get some sample tweets for free. Um, and we're only using about 1% of the US tweets. Uh, st uh, we started the collection from November 2015. So it's been, been about uh, one, one and a half years. And also you can see the number is changing. The reason is it is live. So as we speak, new tweets are coming to the system uh, with at the uh, speed. Roughly it's about 18 to 20 tweets per second. Okay, this is uh, what's happening. And our goal is, Given this large amount of data, whether we can allow a user to be able to explore the data and even, even visualize data. This is the purpose, and see whether we can achieve the goal. Now for tweets, um, let's assume uh, we want to look at uh, all the tweets that are relevant to a topic. Uh, let's say uh, Zika. I'm using Zika as one example here. So what I can do is, as a user, I can type in Zika. I can type in, uh, click the submit button, and the system can just show uh, all the uh, trees mentioned in this keyword. And, uh, and then, if you want, if you even wish, you can just click this one. You can see some of the trees. See, uh, now is 11:29, and the last time it was this record was tweeted like about one hour ago. So this is live here. Um, in addition, we show all the distribution over time. Uh, not surprisingly. There was a peak last summer. Do you still remember why we had a peak at the time? Because of the Olympic Games in, in Rio. And last summer, there was a concern about this, this uh, epidemic uh, virus. And then gradually, the, the concern disappeared. So th that was this, 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 uh, illustrated by this uh, temporal distribution. Um, we also show this uh, kind of a spatial distribution uh, based on the the color, uh, the color indicates the density of the number of trees per state. Uh, now, as a user, suppose I want to uh, go deeper into some uh, sub uh, time window. So I want to see what's going on with this particular uh, time window. So I, I can easily just uh, limit my window size to any length I want. And then the system is so efficient, it can give us the results almost immediately. So that this new result, is based on those tweets in the particular time window from about uh, June 2016 to about uh, November 2016. Okay, I can also arbitrarily change the time window, and the system can give us the latest results. And I can even slide the window the way I want it. Okay, and since the system is so efficient, so responsive, we can immediately see the results after changing the corresponding time condition. So the next question is. Well, we look at the distribution over different states. We would love to see 
the local distributions in different states. So in particular, since we're in California, we want to know what's happening in California. By the way, people, some people may ask, hey, well, it's not fair because uh, California has a lot of people, Texas has a lot of people, then the color doesn't indicate the real kind of average number of tweets per, per, per person. And that, that's very easy. Uh, Shen Jie is one of our students who did that feature. You can easily click this button, and we can do normaliz normalization by dividing the number of trees by the population of that state, as you wish. So now let's go to uh, California. And if you click, double click California, we go to the next level, we can see how the uh, uh, trees are geographically distributed across different counties. And again, not surprisingly, there are a lot of trees in this one, which is Los Angeles County, because LA has a lot of uh, uh, people. And you can also click that one to do normalization if you want. If you go even further, do you know where we are in this map? This is us, this is Orange County. And now you can see that the shape of all of the different counties. So you can cl click uh, Orange County, and at this level, we can show the distribution across different uh, cities. So basically, we allow, the system allows uh, the user to arbitrarily change the conditions on the time dimension, space dimension, and also the textual dimension. In this way, since the system is very efficient, we, we, can, we can help the user analyze and visualize data. If some region has something that looks very suspicious, you can dive into that region and go to do a deeper analysis. Okay. And another question is, uh, what's happening behind the scene? Why are we doing this? Again, as I mentioned before, even though we use social media as an example, you can imagine there are many other cases where you need this kind of uh, tools. Think about the IoT applications, think about uh, uh, cell phone log analysis, think about the civilian systems, and those systems, they have a very similar the characteristic, which is large volume, dynamic data, uh, and you want to do this kind of a very powerful interactive analysis and visualization. Our solution can make that one happen, too. So, so what is the granularity of the location information of every tweet? So the granularity of the location of each tweet is, for, for now, most of the tweets, we have the city level uh, information. And Twitter, last year, they changed the API, and due to privacy concerns, they Earlier, they gave a lot of uh, information about the exact location of a tweet. Uh, later, they just uh, changed the API by only giving you the kind of the city, city of that particular tweet. And for many cases, cities or city level granularity is good enough. And how to obtain data, we treat it as a separate problem. And we assume the client can give us the data. We, we enable that kind of analysis. Question? Yeah. So that what's happening behind the scene? Um, clearly, due to the large volume of data, we cannot have a single uh, machine solution. It won't scale. Uh, the back end of the system, uh, this is our uh, mini cluster. Um, we are running the whole thing on a cluster of uh, uh, computers. And this one, I just noticed that uh, the, the middle one is uh, uh, iPhone Plus, iPhone 6 Plus, that gives you some idea about the size of these uh, machines. It has uh, six machines. Uh, each of the machines is a Nuke a Linux server uh, with uh, four cores, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, and uh, one TB of hard disk, and half, half terabytes of uh, flash drive. Uh, each costs about uh, $800. Is there any concern about the difference between the where the user lives or, or the city? Does it relate to where they live or where they're tweeting from? So, uh, yeah, the question is about whether the, the, the tweet is about the location of the tweet or the location of that uh, uh, user. I think right, the data right. we got is really based on the, the location of the tweet. Right? It ha was how interpreting semantic the, of the location we read out to the application. I, I believe that's the location of the tweet, not of the, not the user. <coughs> so, I guess, the, as you said, Twitter gives the 1% of the uh, public tweets. and. I actually worked on worked on a project like this, and we were trying to do uh, sentiment analysis on tweets and try to identify how people will think on a given topic, and we could uh, just uh, show the time and how people think in different locations and stuff. And there were the problem was there were a lot of tweets that had no location, 
and it's yeah one person you are getting one person and I'm guessing that a lot of of it doesn't have locations so does this change the general idea about the uh, results yeah so I mean, getting the exact location of a tweet is itself is very challenging problem and I know there are a lot of uh, uh, papers talking about how to do some inference uh, based on the data to see uh, to identify the exact location of the of the, that particular tweet, and uh, that's not the main focus of our work. We just assume by doing some pre-processing, you can get the, the location information and plug information into the system. And, and but how to get it? We treat it as separate one. We 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 prefer to borrow or use one of the existing solutions to uh, to solve it. In fact, uh, one of our modules is about geotagging. We have one module that. Uh, tries to geotag one particular tweet to identify location. And, but, but that's not a main focus of our system, okay, because we cannot solve all the problems in one project. And back to the system analysis uh, requirement, I do, want, I do want to emphasize the fact that uh, one nice feature of this system is we allow open, uh, we allow many other uh, machine learning models to be included as the user default functions. In fact, in one of our demos in the in this event, you will see that our, our students have been working very hard, like uh, Chen Luo and Shen Jie, a few other uh, people, they have been wor working very hard to demonstrate that how you can include a, a, a machine learning model to do, say, sentiment analysis into the framework. Either you do it offline, one data, before data gets, gets in the system, how to run the model to get uh, some sentiment value, or runtime, when you do a query, you want to, on the fly, run some UDF model, uh, machine learning model to identify the sending analysis. And both cases are solved. You, you can see the demo in the, in the, in the event. Um, and so the, the whole cluster costs less than $4,000. And now if you have more data, very simple, just three more hardware, because, because our backend software solution is relying on the apparel solution. So it's highly scalable. And the whole architecture is share nothing. So they don't share memory, they don't share this, everything share nothing. So this is the one thing I, uh, I want to demonstrate, um, but I want to show you the, the backend architecture. Okay, so uh, w w what was happening behind the scene? So this is the backend architecture. Um, we use a three-tier architecture where the really big backend is running our homegrown database system called uh, Apache Asterisk DB. So uh, this is a project we have been doing since 2009. Uh, at a high level, you can say it is a parallel uh, database system that can support huge amounts of uh, the data that are used in the same structured data model. Okay. Uh, compared to many other solutions available on the market, like uh, uh, Spark SQL, Mongo, uh, uh, we have our own position, our own value here. Because it, it is a parallel. It is supporting semi-structured data. It has its own uh, storage, indexing, uh, runtime, uh, query, query compiler, query, query, uh, query, query language. It's a whole stack solution. Um, this is the one layer. The second layer, the, the, group, the, the, the green layer is called the Cloudberry. Cloudberry is a middleware layer that is trying to enable this kind of uh, interactive analysis. I Meaning when I say interactive, I mean when a user gives a new query, we love to get the answer to, to the user within one second. Okay. The challenge is, when data volume is so huge, how can you do it? Uh, data is so big, uh, so the database system, no matter what, uh, if, even if you have access a lot of uh, uh, records one, one by one, that might take you maybe one minute or even or one hour. How can we build a separate layer to do some additional uh, logic, like a caching, in order to reduce the response time? so that the user can enjoy this kind of interactive uh, experience. This is the second layer here. This is the second uh, system we are building here. How much more time do I have? Uh, maybe a few more minutes. A few more minutes. Then I have a few more minutes now. I want to use uh, the remaining time to demonstrate the second system we're building in this space. Again, it's about uh, uh, social media data analysis. Okay. So the system, second system uh, we're building is called the TextDB. Uh, the main purpose of this system is to solve this, the last challenge I mentioned, which is um, for non-IT people, how we can make it possible for these people to do analysis. Even for IT people, how can we reduce the cost of doing this kind of analysis? And the, the principle behind this system is to provide 
a GUI-based interface using which user can easily compose a job and do analysis. And this, this one complements what we saw earlier, because the previous one we saw is uh, storage, indexing, query, and visualization. This one is more about get data from the database and do the analysis using this kind of a GUI interface uh, without writing a single line of code. Okay. Again, I'm going to use a, a, this one to show a demo. So uh, the system, the backend, is already running uh, with some tweets uh, generated. And then I can just say, I first want to get all the tweets. Uh, I have lots of tables. You can just pick one table called uh, Twitter. So now this operator is getting all the data from the Twitter table. And next thing is, I want to, maybe the too many, I want to get some of the uh, uh, tweets. I can do a sampler, a sampler uh, method. So I, maybe I want to get maybe just uh, maybe a 30. Uh, I want to, want to get a 30 records out of this huge amount of data. I do some sampling here. Okay, I connect these two uh, boxes. And then next one is maybe I'm only interested in all the trees that mention a particular keyword, like uh, Trump. Use Trump as an example. What I can do is I can just uh, drag and drop this uh, box here. I say I'm only interested in all the uh, tweets mentioned in Trump, and then uh, I'm only interested in the text field. Remember, this is the, we're using the original model here. So we have one more step. We'll connect it to st two, uh, two steps, and then on top of these results, I want to do sentiment, do sentiment analysis. Okay, here uh, we already included uh, one of the popular packages called Stanford NRB that can do sentiment analysis. I can just drag this one and drop it here, and I want to do the analysis on one attribute, and the output of this analysis is called the sentiment. Okay, So I'm doing sentiment analysis, and I connect this one to this one here. So this is my job so far. At the end, I want to see the final results. So then I just connect this one. I want to get 10 results, okay? and connect these two boxes. This is my job. To summarize, I gather uh, tweets from the table, and then I sample about 30, 30 tweets, and then I do the filtering by only looking at all the tweets mentioned in Trump. And for all these tweets, I run a standard uh, NLP sentiment analysis to get a sentiment, and then I see the results, and I only get 10 results. And even less, let's say I only get a five here. Okay. This is my plan. Okay. And then I run the whole thing. And I got the results. So there are not too many results, and then each of them, we see the results. This one says, uh, debate review, and this is the content of the tweet, and Mr. Trump, you called climate change a uh, Chinese hoax. This is the raw, <laughs> raw text. And the, the Stanford NLP package thinks uh, the sentiment is one. Um, one means on the negative side. Okay? It's value, value between zero and four. Zero is the most negative, four is the most positive, one is more on the negative side. So the, the package thinks is more on the negative side. Okay? Now, if you're interested in these results, and very simple, just click this uh, download button, button. You can download all the records into a local file, and then you can do your local analysis. Notice that in the whole thing I did, it took less than uh, two minutes, and I didn't write a single line of code. So if, uh, even for us, some of our uh, students, when they want to do this analysis, this kind of tools can make their life much easier. And then, of course, the many other things we're doing. Uh, in addition, uh, as we speak, some of the people from the public health department are using this tool to do analysis in their domain. And from the interaction between us and them is very interesting because we set up a server and they don't need to run any software, they don't need to update any software. From their perspective, all they need to do is just open a browser and can use the browser to do this kind of analysis. And we do all the backend uh, data ingestion, software update, and adding some additional features. We provide them as a service and they can benefit from our software. And so this is a, also a work in progress. And what for launch for the next time? What we plan to do is I show which I showed you two systems. One is uh, kind of a Twitter map. Uh, the other one is this text to be. We would love to integrate these two systems into one framework where the user can first get the initial data and then use this uh, the second tool to get data from the first one. Do this kind of analysis and the final result will be sent back to the the original system to the to the visualization. Then uh, we can finish the whole loop. And there's one more thing we can we want to do, uh, which is more on um, uh, machine learning and the NLP, because in the early example I mentioned, suppose I want to detect all the tweets 
that the mention that, that are that are from users who have diabetes. How can we achieve this goal by analyzing the tweets using uh, machine learning techniques or NLP techniques and how to integrate the whole thing into the whole pipeline? That's often one of the issues we, have, we had to fix. And we, we are pretty we know what we want to do and how to solve it. Okay. So I I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that everything that we're doing here is uh, systems oriented and they are open source. Uh, it, most of them are on GitHub. Uh, given our previous experiences, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, software engineering to make sure the system we're building can be used not just by us, can also be used by other people from other domains. Uh, in addition, uh, I want to thank all the students, uh, other colleagues, who have made a great contribution to these this projects. And this is some picture we, we, we took uh, for some of the uh, team members, and most of them are students. Okay. So I'll stop here. I will take maybe uh, one or two more questions. Okay. Yeah, can you uh, provide the results by user attributes? That is, you know, in the use in a Twitter data, there are user attributes. Whether the person is an actor or a doctor or associated with a uh, given uh, you know, corporation, you know, the user description and the user. Yes, that information. I mean, the, the, the information was available. This one was provided by the Twitter API. For every tweet, we have like a city user screen name, username, county, tweet link, all all the different attributes. We just take whatever the raw data have included. We just show it to the user. And of course, the user has the freedom, freedom to decide among maybe 20 attributes I'm only interested in maybe seven of them. That one, they have the option. The other thing is, if the user may want to run some additional logic, like some machine learning model to do sentiment analysis, and then they can use those techniques to even to enhance the, the data by appending more attributes to it. So the whole framework allows that. A second question, uh, can you, uh provide information whether a given tweet uh, is coming from, let's say, a hospital or a research institute area or, you know, a given geographical area? Um, it depends on data. In this one, we, we, we have to rely on the, the original data. Because for us, we, we want to stay focused on the, the processing, uh, storage, analyzing of the data. And how it is obtained is not our focus because we there's another team of people who are who should, who should provide that kind of data. So back to your, your question, my answer is we just purely rely on what data is, has included. And I also want to emphasize that all the things I just showed here, we have the corresponding demos in this event. We have a few posters. You, if you're interested in more details, you're welcome to stop by our tables and ask more questions or get more information. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? If not, uh, enjoy the, the showcase here.